Review. Listening section. Questions 1 to 4. Conversation. Listen to a conversation on campus between two students. Wait up. I need to ask you about something. Oh, hi, Jack. Hi. Listen, I was just wondering whether you understood what Professor Carson was saying about the review session next Monday. Sure. Why? Well, the way I get it, it's optional. Right. He said if we didn't have any questions, we should just use the time to study on our own. Okay, that's what I thought. Maybe I'll just skip it then. Well, it's up to you. But the thing is, sometimes at a review session, someone else will ask a question, and, you know, the, the way the professor explains it, it's really helpful. I mean, to figure out what he wants on the test. Oh, I didn't think about it that way. But it makes sense. So you're going to go then? Absolutely. Um... I've had a couple other classes with Carson, and the review sessions always helped get me organized for the test. Oh. And if you've missed any of the lectures, he usually has extra handouts from all the classes, so... Well, I haven't missed any of the sessions. Me neither. But I'm still going to be there. Look, uh, if it's like the other review sessions, the first hour he's going to go over the main points for each class. Kind of like an outline of the course. Then from 5.30 to 6.30 he'll take questions. That's the best part. In the last half hour, he'll stay for individual conferences with people who need extra help. I usually don't stay for that. Okay, so we just show up at the regular time and place for class? Or not, if you decide to study on your own. Right. But don't you think he'll notice who's there? He said he wasn't going to take attendance. Yeah, but still. It's a fairly large class. But if he's grading your final and he remembers you were at the review, it might make a difference. Maybe. I think the important thing is just to study really hard and do your best. But the review sessions help me study. I think they're really good. Okay, thanks. I guess I'll go too. So I'll see you there. Yeah, I think I, I'd better go. 1. Why does the man want to talk with the woman? 2. Why does the woman think that the review session will be helpful? 3. Why does the man decide to go to the review session? 4. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the following question. He said he wasn't going to take attendance. Yeah, but still. It's a fairly large class. Why does the man say this? Yeah, but still. Review section, questions 5 to 10. Lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in a zoology class. As you know from the textbook, mimicry isn't limited to insects, but it's most common among them, and by mimicry I'm referring to the likeness between two insects that aren't closely related but look very much alike. The insects that engage in mimicry are usually very brightly colored. One of the insects, the one that's characterized by an unpleasant taste, a bad smell, a sting or bite, that insect's called the model. The mimic looks like the model but doesn't share the characteristic that protects the model from predators. But of course, the predators associate the color pattern or some other trait with the unpleasant characteristic and leave both insects alone. Henry Bates was one of the first naturalists who noticed that some butterflies that closely resemble each other were actually unrelated. So mimicry, in which one species copies another, is called Batesian mimicry. I have some lab specimens of a few common mimics in the cases here in the front of the room, and I want you to have a chance to look at them before the end of the class. There's a day-flying moth with brown and white and yellow markings. And this moth's the model because it has a very unpleasant taste and tends to be avoided by moth eaters. But you'll notice that the swallowtail butterfly mounted beside it 
has very similar coloration. And actually, the swallowtail doesn't have the unpleasant taste at all. Another example is the monarch butterfly, which is probably more familiar to you since they pass through this area when they're migrating. But you may not know that they have a very nasty taste because I seriously doubt that any of you have eaten one. But for the predators who do eat butterflies, this orange and black pattern on the monarchs, a warning signal not to sample it. So the viceroy butterfly here is a mimic. Same type of coloring, but no nasty taste. Nevertheless, the viceroy isn't bothered by predators either because it's mistaken for the monarch. So how does a predator know that the day-flying moth and the monarch aren't good to eat? Well, a bird only has to eat one to start avoiding them all, models and mimics. A stinging bumblebee is another model insect. The sting's painful and occasionally even fatal for predators, so there are a large number of mimics. For example, there's a beetle that mimics bumblebees by beating its wings to make noise. And the astonishing thing is that it's able to do this at the same rate as the bumblebee, so exactly the same buzzing sounds created. I don't have a specimen of that beetle, but I do have a specimen of the hoverfly, which is a mimic of the honeybee. And it makes a similar buzzing sound, too. When you compare the bee with the fly, you'll notice that the honeybee has two sets of wings, and the hoverfly has only one set of wings. But as you can imagine, the noise and the more or less similar body and color will keep most predators from approaching closely enough to count the wings. Some insects without stingers have body parts that mimic the sharp stinger of wasps or bees. Although the hawk moth is harmless, it has a bundle of hairs that protrudes from the rear of its body. The actual purpose of these hairs is to spread scent, but to predators, the bundle mimics a stinger closely enough to keep them away, especially if the hawk moth is moving in a threatening way as if it were about to sting. There's a hawk moth here in the case, and to me at least, it doesn't look that much like the wasp mounted beside it. But remember, when you're looking at a specimen, it's stationary. And in nature, the movement's also part of the mimicry. Oh, here's a specimen of an ant, and this is interesting. Another naturalist, Fritz Mueller, hypothesized that similarity among a large number of species could help protect all of them. Here's what he meant. After a few battles with a stinging or biting ant, especially when the entire colony comes to the aid of the ant being attacked, a predator will learn to avoid ants, even those that don't sting or bite, because they all look alike and the predator associates the bad experience with the group. And by extension, the predator will also avoid insects that mimic ants, like harmless beetles and spiders. Look at this. I have a drawing of a specimen of a stinging ant, beside a specimen of a brownish spider, and the front legs of the spider are mounted so they look more like antennae because that's just what the spider does to mimic an ant. That way it appears to have six legs like an ant instead of eight like a spider. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left and I want you to take this opportunity to look at the specimen cases here in the front of the room. I'll be available for questions if you have them. How about forming two lines on either side of the cases, so more of it of the cases, so more of you can see at the same time? 5. What is the lecture mainly about? Six. How does the professor organize the lecture? Seven. According to the lecture, what are some characteristics of a model? Eight. How does the professor explain Batesian mimicry? Nine. In the lecture, the professor explains Fritz Mueller's hypothesis. Indicate whether each of the following supports the hypothesis. Click in the correct box for each choice.
Ten. Indicate whether each insect below refers to a model or a mimic. Click in the correct box for each phrase. Quiz Think Section. This is a quiz for the listening section of the TOEFL IBT. This section tests your ability to understand campus conversations and academic lectures. During the quiz, you will listen to one conversation and one lecture. You will hear each conversation or lecture one time and respond to questions about them. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to answer the questions. Once you begin, do not pause the audio. Questions one to four. Conversation. Listen to a conversation on campus between a professor and a student. Hi, Professor Taylor. Hi, Jack. I was hoping that I could talk with you for a few minutes. It's about the test. Oh, okay. Well, I've never taken an open book test, and I just don't know what to expect. Does that mean I can use my book during the test as a reference? Exactly, and you can use your notes in the handouts too. Really? Yes, but Jack, since you've never taken an open book test, I should warn you: it isn't as easy as it seems. Because. Because you don't have enough time to look up every answer and still finish the test. Oh. That's the mistake that most students make. You see, the purpose of an open book test is to allow you to look up a detail or make a citation. But the students who are looking up every answer spend too much time on the first few questions, and then they have to leave some of the questions at the end blank. So it's important to pace yourself. If it, it is, the test's one hour long, and there are twenty questions, so you have to be working on question ten in half an hour. Right, that's clear enough. So, how do I prepare for an open book test? Well, the first thing to do is to organize your notes into subject categories, so you can refer easily to topics that might appear in the test questions, and then study your book just like you would for any other test. Well, some people mark passages in the book with flags to make it easier to locate certain facts, but other than that, just prepare for a test like you usually do. Right,、um, Professor Taylor, could I ask you?、Um... Why are you making this test open book? I mean, we have to study for it like always. So, I hope you don't mind that I asked. I'm I'm just curious. I don't mind at all, Jack. I think an open book test provides an opportunity for real learning. Too many of my students used to memorize small facts for a test and then forget all about the broad concepts. I want you to study the concepts so you'll leave my class with a general perspective that you won't forget. Wow, I can relate to that. Most people can, but the way I see it, this is a psychology class, not a memory class. Well, thanks for taking the time to explain everything, Dr. Taylor. You're welcome, Jack. See you next week then. Okay. Have a nice weekend. You too. One. Why does the man go to see his professor? Two. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the following question. Yes, but Jack, since you've never taken an open book test, I should warn you: it isn't as easy as it seems. Because. Because you don't have enough time to look up every answer and still finish the test. Why does the student say this? Because. Three, how should Jack prepare for the test? Four, why does the professor give open book tests? Questions five through fourteen, 
lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in an economics class. The professor is talking about supply-side economics. The fundamental concept in supply-side economics is that tax cuts will spur economic growth, because these tax cuts will allow entrepreneurs to invest their tax savings, thereby creating more jobs and profits. Which ultimately allow the entrepreneur and the additional employees to pay more taxes, even though the rates are lower. Let's go through that again, step by step. First, taxes are lowered. Then, business owners use their tax savings to hire more workers. This increases profits, so the business owner pays more taxes at a lower rate. And in addition, the newly hired workers all pay taxes as well. So there's more income flowing into the government through taxes. Historically, in the United States, several presidents have championed tax cuts to get the economy moving. Although this top-down economic theory is more popular among Republicans, who have traditionally been aligned with business interests, in 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a Democratic president, also used tax cuts to improve economic conditions. He probably wouldn't qualify as a true supply sider, but he did understand and capitalize on the basic concept. But it's perhaps Ronald Reagan who's most closely associated with supply side economics, so much so that his policies in the 1980s were referred to as Reaganomics. During his term of office, Reagan cut taxes, but Actually, the huge increases in spending, especially for the military budget, caused supply siders to debate with their conservative cousins. You see, conservative and supply side are not the same thing. Traditional conservative economists insist that tax cuts should be accompanied by fiscal responsibility, that is, spending cuts by government. But supply side economists aren't concerned with spending. They rely on tax cuts to do the job. Period. Back to the supply side policies under Reagan. Well, the supply siders believed that the economic growth resulting from tax cuts would be so great and the total increase in taxes so high that the United States economy would grow beyond its deficit spending. When this didn't happen, some economists distanced themselves from the label supply side. While advocating tax cuts with greater attention to spending, even Milton Friedman, Nobel laureate and an influential member of the Chicago School of Economics, even Friedman's now pointing out that the problem is how to hold down government spending, which accounts for about half of the national income. But he still looks to tax cuts as a solution. So. A more recent problem for supply siders, in addition to the fiscal responsibility issue, is that corporate business tends to move their investment and jobs overseas, which critics say eventually will lead to high unemployment in the United States. But Friedman insists that by moving jobs abroad, incomes and dollars are created that sooner or later will be used to purchase goods that are made in the United States and produce jobs. In the United States, it's supply-side economics with a global perspective. In fact, conservatives and supply-siders alike argue that progress in the American economy has been made from technological changes and increased productivity, producing different goods or more goods with fewer workers. Dr. Barry Asmus cites the example of the millions of tons of copper wire that had to be produced for us to communicate by telephone across country. Now, a few satellites will do the job. Clearly, the people who were employed in the copper wire industry suffered unemployment when the change in technology occurred. Or another example: in the case of manufacturing, 30 years ago. A General Electric plant required 3,000 workers to produce one dishwasher every minute. Now the same plant needs 300 people to produce one dishwasher every six seconds. So you might focus on the fact that many workers will be without jobs making dishwashers, but what do you suppose supply siders would say? Think this through. They'd counter with the argument that the dishwasher will be cheaper as a result of the increased productivity, 
so more people can buy dishwashers and still have some money left. Again, Asmus reasons that if the consumers spend money on more goods, they create jobs because workers are needed to produce the goods they buy. If they invest their money, they also create more jobs by supporting the economy. So, some people do lose jobs because of technology, productivity, and the shift of manufacturing overseas, and only 70% find better paying jobs when they transition to another job. Yes, that's true, and it's a personally painful transition for those involved. But the argument by supply-siders and many conservatives as well is that this is temporary unemployment, and the important word here is temporary. So, the temporary unemployment occurs in the process of shifting people not just from one job to another, but from one segment of the economy to another. To use an analogy, it would be like the shift from farming to manufacturing that's occurred worldwide as better methods allowed fewer farmers to produce food and resulted in the movement of farmers from the country to the cities where they became employed in manufacturing. And now there's a shift from manufacturing to technology, which, if supply-siders and conservative economists are to be believed, will result in an even higher standard of living in the United States and globally. But, of course, the success of the United States within the global economy will largely depend on a favorable balance of trade, how much we can produce in this country, in the new segments of the economy, and how much we can sell abroad. 5. What is the lecture mainly about? Six. How does the professor organize the lecture? Seven. According to the lecturer, what did Kennedy and Reagan have in common? Eight. What would Milton Friedman most likely say about moving a manufacturing plant from the United States to a site abroad? Nine. According to Barry Asmus, what are two key ways that consumers contribute to the creation of new jobs? Ten. How does the professor explain the shift from manufacturing to technology? Eleven. Why does the professor mention the General Electric plant? Twelve. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the following question. Now, the same plant needs 300 people to produce one dishwasher every six seconds. So, you might focus on the fact that many workers will be without jobs making dishwashers. But what do you suppose supply-siders would say? Think this through. Why does the professor say this? Think this through. Thirteen. In the lecture, the professor explains supply-side economics. Indicate whether each of the following strategies supports the theory. Fourteen. Put the following events in the correct order. Review section. Question 1. 
Example question. Where would you like to study in the United States? Question one. Example answer. I'd like to study at a university in Washington, D.C. because I have family in the area. And, and it'd be nice to have them close by so I could visit them on holidays and in case I need advice or help. I've been to Washington several times and I like it there. It's an international city with restaurants and stores where I can buy food and other things from my country while,、uh, while I'm living abroad. And Washington's an exciting place. I've gone on several tours, but I still have many places on my list of sites to see. Also,、um, there are trains to New York and Florida, so I can take advantage of my free time to see other cities.、Um, As for the universities, there are several,、uh, several excellent schools in Washington, and, and I'd probably be accepted at one of them. Question, example, question. Some students live in dormitories on campus. Other students live in apartments off campus. Which living situation do you think is better, and why? Question two, example, answer. A lot of my friends live off campus, but I think that living in a dormitory is a better situation,、uh, especially for the first year at a new college. Dormitories are structured to provide opportunities for interaction and for making friends. As a foreign student, it would be an advantage to be in a dormitory to practice English with other residents and to find study groups in the dormitory. And dorm students have、uh, less responsibility for meals, laundry, and. and Uh, cleaning, because there are meal plans and services available、uh, as part of the fees. Besides, there's only one check to write, so the bookkeeping, it's a minimal. And the dormitory offers an ideal location near the library and, um, and um, all the recreational facilities and, and the classroom buildings. Question t h r e e Talk. Now, listen to a student who is expressing an opinion about the proposal. I understand that a branch campus on the city's west side would be convenient for students who live near the proposed site, and it might attract more local students, but I oppose the plan because it will redirect funds from the main campus where several classroom buildings need repair Hanover Hall, for one. And、uh, a lot of the equipment in the chemistry and physics labs should be replaced. In my lab classes, we don't do some of the experiments because we don't have enough equipment. And we need more teachers on the main campus. I'd like to see the branch campus funding allocated for teachers' salaries in order to decrease the student teacher ratios. Most of the freshman classes are huge, and there's very little interaction with professors. professors. A branch campus would be a good addition, but not until some of the problems on the main campus have been taken care of. Question three, example question. The man expresses his opinion of the proposal in the announcement. Report his opinion and explain the reasons he gives for having that opinion. Question three, example answer. The man concedes that the branch campus might be advantageous for students living close to the new location. But he's concerned that the funding for a branch campus will affect funding on main campus for, for important capital improvements such as classroom buildings that are、um, in need of repair.、Um, and equipment in the science labs is getting old, so it needs to be replaced. And he also points out that more teachers are needed for the main campus in order to reduce student teacher ratios, which Which would improve the quality of teaching and the amount of interaction in classes. So the man feels that more attention should be given to the main campus, and funding should be directed to improve the main campus before a branch campus is considered. Question for lecture. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic. English uses a system of about a dozen word endings to express grammatical meaning. The ing for present time, s for possession and plurality, and、uh, the ed for the past, to mention only a few. But how and when do children learn them? 
Well, in a classic study by Burko in the 1950s, investigators, they elicited a series of forms that required the target endings. For example, a picture was shown of a bird, and, and the investigator identified it by saying, this is a wug. Then the children were shown two similar birds. To, um, to elicit the sentence, there are two... And if the children completed the sentence by saying wugs, well, then it was inferred that they had learned the S ending. Okay. Essential to that study was the use of nonsense words like wug, since the manipulation of the endings could have been supported by words that the children had, had already heard. In any case, charts were developed to demonstrate the gradual nature of grammatical acquisition. And the performance by children from 18 months to four years confirmed the basic theory of child language, that the, the gradual reduction of grammatical errors, that these are evidence of language acquisition. Question 4. Example question. Describe the WUG experiment and explain why the results supported the basic theory of child language acquisition. Question 4. Example answer. In English, there are several important word endings that express grammatical relationships. For example, the ED ending signals that the speaker is talking about the past, and the S ending means more than one uh, when it's used at the end of a noun. So when children learn English, they... Um, they make errors in these endings, but they gradually refine their use until they master them. In the WUG experiment, Burko created nonsense words to get children to use endings. So, so the researchers could um, follow their development. It was important not to use real words because the children might have been influenced by a word they'd heard before. So this experiment provided data about the time it takes and the age when endings are learned. It supported the basic theory of child language that um, sorting out grammatical errors is a feature of the speech of four-year-olds and a stage in language acquisition. Question. Conversation. Did your scholarship check come yet? Yeah, it came last week. Didn't yours? No, that's a problem. And everything's due at the same time. Tuition, my dorm fee, and let's not forget about books. I need about $400 just for books. Well, do you have any money left from last semester? In your checking account, I mean? Some, but not nearly enough. The check probably won't be here until the end of the month, and I won't get paid at work for two more weeks. I don't know what I'm going to do. How about your credit card? Could you use that? Maybe but I'm afraid I'll get the credit card bill before I get the scholarship check, and then I'll be in worse trouble because of, you know, the interest rate for the credit card on top of everything else. I see your point. Still, the check might come before the credit card bill. You might have to gamble, unless... I'm listening. Well, unless you take out a student loan, a short-term loan. They have them set up at the student credit union. Isn't that where you have your checking account? Mm-hmm. So you could take out a short-term loan and pay it off on the day that you get your check. It wouldn't cost that much for interest because it would probably be only a few weeks. That's what I'd do. Question 5. Example question. Describe the woman's budgeting problem and the two suggestions that the man makes. What do you think the woman should do and why? Why? Question 5. Example answer. The woman doesn't have enough money for her expenses. Um, she has to pay tuition and her dorm fees due at the same time. Besides that, she needs to buy books. So the problem is everything has to be paid now, and she won't get her scholarship check till the end of the month. And she won't get her paycheck for two weeks. Um, the man suggests that she use her credit card because she won't have to pay it off until the end of the month. But the problem is, the interest would be substantial if the scholarship check's delayed. The other idea, to take out a student loan, that seems better because the loan could be paid off on the day the check arrives, instead of a fixed date, and it wouldn't cost much to get a short-term loan at the student credit union. So, I support applying for a student loan. Questions Lecture 
Two types of irrigation methods that are used worldwide are mentioned in your textbook. Flood irrigation. That's been a method in use since ancient times, and we still use it today where water's cheap. Basically, canals connect a water supply like a river or a reservoir to the fields where ditches are constructed with valves that allow farmers to siphon water from the canal, sending it down through the ditches. So that way the field can be, the field can be totally flooded, or smaller narrow ditches along the rows can be filled with water to irrigate the crop. But this method does have quite a few disadvantages. Like I said, it's contingent upon cheap water because it isn't very efficient and the flooding isn't easy to control. I mean, the rows closer to the canal usually receive much more water, and of course, if the field isn't flat, then the water won't be evenly distributed. Not to mention the cost of building canals and ditches and maintaining the system. So let's consider the alternative, the sprinkler system. In this method of irrigation, it's easier to control the water and more efficient since the water is directed only on the plants. But in hot climates, some of the water can evaporate in the air. Still, the main problem with sprinklers is the expense for installation and maintenance because there's a very complicated pipe system and that usually involves a lot more repair and even replacement of parts. And, of course, we have to factor in the labor costs in feasibility studies for sprinklers. Question 6. Example question. Using examples from the lecture, Describe two general types of irrigation systems. Then explain the disadvantages of each type. Question 6. Example answer. Two methods of irrigation were discussed in the lecture. First, flood irrigation. It involves the release of water into canals and drainage ditches that flow into the fields. The disadvantages of the flood method, um, well... It isn't very efficient since more water is used in flooding than the crops actually uh, need, and also it isn't easy to control. Another problem is the initial expense for the construction of the canals and the connecting ditches as well as, as maintenance. And besides that, if the fields aren't flat, the water doesn't, I mean, it isn't distributed evenly. The second method is sprinkler irrigation, which uses less water and provides better control but there's some evaporation and the pipe system's complicated and can be expensive to install and maintain. So there's usually a lot more labor cost because the equipment must be repaired and replaced more often than a canal system. Quiz King section. This is a quiz for the speaking section of the TOEFL IBT. This section tests your ability to communicate in English in an academic context. During the quiz, you will respond to six speaking questions. You may take notes as you listen. You may use your notes to answer the questions. The reading passages and the questions are written, but the directions will be spoken. Once you begin, do not pause the audio. Number one. Listen for a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. If you were asked to choose one movie that has influenced your thinking, which one would you choose? Why? What was especially impressive about the movie? Use specific reasons and details to explain your choice. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Number 2. Listen for a question that asks your opinion about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you have 15 seconds to prepare and 45 seconds to record your answer. Some people think that teachers should be evaluated by the performance of their students on standardized tests at the end of the term. Other people maintain that teachers should be judged by their own performance in the classroom and not by the scores that their students achieve on tests. Which approach do you think is better and why? Use specific reasons and examples to support your opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number three, read a short passage and listen to a talk on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. A meeting is planned to explain the residence requirements for in-state tuition. Read the policy in the college catalog. You have 45 seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to a student who is speaking at the meeting. He is expressing his opinion about the policy. Well, I agree with most of the policy, but what I don't understand is why I have to use my parents' address as my permanent address. This is my third year in a dorm on campus, and I've gone to school every summer, so I've lived in this state for three consecutive years. I don't pay state taxes because I don't earn enough as a full-time student to, uh, to pay taxes. But I don't receive support from my parents either. I have a small grant and a student loan that I'm responsible for, and, and I plan to live and work in this state after I graduate. So um, I think students like me should be eligible for a waiver. The student expresses his opinion of the policy for in-state tuition. Report his opinion and explain the reasons that he gives for having that opinion. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep.
Number 4. Read a short passage and listen to a lecture on the same topic. Then listen for a question about them. After you hear the question, you have 30 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now read the passage about communication with primates. You have 45 seconds to complete it. Please begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture in a zoology class. The professor is talking about a primate experiment. Probably one of the most publicized linguistic research studies with primates is the Kanzi experiment. Dr. Sue Savage Rumbaugh had been trying to train a bonobo chimpanzee to communicate using a keyboard adapted with symbols. What is interesting about the experiment is that the chimpanzee's adopted son, Kanzi, also a bonobo chimpanzee, well, Kanzi had been observing and had acquired a rather impressive vocabulary. Savage Rumbaugh and her colleagues kept adding symbols to Kanzi's keyboard and then started a file of laminated flashcards. In addition to the more than 350 symbols that Kanzi learned to use, he also understood the meaning of about 3,000 spoken English words and could respond appropriately to spoken commands. In addition, Kanzi picked up some American Sign Language by watching videos of Coco, a gorilla who used sign language to communicate with his keeper, Penny Patterson. But what about speaking? What about actually vocalizing? Well, yes and no. Kanzi made attempts to vocalize in order to communicate by using speech to identify the symbols that he had learned. But because of the very different vocal tract, the sounds were very high-pitched and distorted. So, for now, communicating with primates appears to be limited to symbolic language. Nevertheless, Kanzi has more than proven that communication is possible. Explain how the example of the Kanzi experiment demonstrates progress in research on primate communication. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number 5. Listen to a short conversation, then listen for a question about it. 
After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to a conversation between a student and her friend. Did you decide to take Johnson's class? Yeah, I'm going to work it out somehow. Yesterday, I walked from the chemistry lab to Hamilton Hall. That's where Johnson's class is. And? And it took me 20 minutes. Uh-oh. You only have 15 minutes between classes, so that means you'll be five minutes late. Listen, why don't you buy a bike? I'm sure you could cut at least five minutes off your time if you took the bike trail. I thought about that, but then I'd have to get a license and I'd have to find somewhere to store it at night. I thought it might be a hassle. Oh, it's not so bad. I have a bike. The license is only $10, and I just park my bike on the deck outside my apartment when the weather's good. And the weather should be okay for most of spring semester. That's true. Well, your other option's to talk with Dr. Johnson. Maybe he'll give you permission to be five minutes late to his class because of the distance from your lab. Actually, I've had several classes with him, and he seems very approachable. Anyway, it's an alternative to the bike, if you don't want to do that. Describe the woman's problem and the two suggestions that her friend makes about how to handle it. What do you think the woman should do, and why? Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Number six, listen to part of a lecture, then listen for a question about it. After you hear the question, you have 20 seconds to prepare and 60 seconds to record your answer. Now listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. The professor is discussing the habitable zone. Of course, stars are too hot to support life. But the light from a star warms orbiting planets or moons, supplying the energy needed for life to develop. Besides energy, a liquid, let's say a chemical solvent of some kind, is also necessary. On Earth, the solvent in which life developed was water. But others, such as ammonia, hydrogen fluoride, or methane might also be appropriate. So, in order for the solvent to remain in liquid form, the planet or moon must lie within a certain range of distances from the star. Why is this so? Well, think about it. If the planet is too close to the star, the solvent will change into a gas, boiling and evaporating. If it's too far from the star, the solvent will freeze, transforming into a solid. For our sun and life as we know it, the habitable zone appears to lie between the orbits of Venus and Mars. Within this range, water remains liquid, and until recently, this area was indeed the accepted scientific definition of the habitable zone for our solar system. But now, scientists have postulated that the habitable zone may be larger than originally supposed. They speculate that the strong gravitational pull caused by larger planets may produce enough energy to heat the cores of orbiting moons. So, that means that these moons may support life. There may be habitable zones far beyond Venus. Using the main points and examples from the lecture, describe the habitable zone. 
and then explain how the definition has been expanded by modern scientists. Please prepare your answer after the beep. Please begin speaking after the beep. Quiz. Speaking section. Example answers. Question 1. Example answer. The movie that's influenced my thinking the most is Fantasia, because it's my first memory of classical music and ballet. One reason the movie was so impressive is um, I was at a very impressionable age when I saw it, five years old. Besides that, it was made using the latest technology. In the 1950s, it was amazing to see detailed animation and, and hear high-quality sound. But what really influenced me was the music in the dance scenes. I especially remember Mickey Mouse dancing with the brooms, and I'm sure I took ballet lessons because of it. The coordination of the storm scene with the music from the Hall of the Mountain King still impresses me when I see it today. And thanks to Walt Disney, classical music is still my favorite music. Question 2. Example answer. I think it's good to evaluate teachers by their students' performance on standardized tests because when teachers and students are judged by the same criteria, they'll work efficiently toward the same goals. Now, some teachers argue that tests aren't important, but still, students need good scores for admission to universities, so the tests are important to them. If teachers were evaluated on the same basis, then they'd pay more attention to the criteria on tests to design their lessons so both students and teachers would benefit. Another reason to use this evaluation is to compare teachers from different schools on a standardized scale. And this system would be more fair, too, because the possibility of a teacher getting a high evaluation because of friendship with the supervisor is also eliminated. Question 3. Example answer. The student said that he mostly agreed with the policy for in-state tuition, but he disagreed with a couple of requirements. For one thing, you can't use a campus address as a permanent address. But he's a dorm student, and he explained that he's lived in the dorm for three years because he's gone to school every summer without returning to his parents' home to live. So, the dorm really is his permanent address right now. He doesn't think he should have to use his parents' out-of-state address. Besides that, he hasn't been subsidized by his parents. In the policy, the most recent taxes must be filed in the state of residence, but uh, he didn't make enough money to pay taxes. He didn't mention in which state he had his voter's registration or car registration and driver's licenses, but he said that he plans to continue living and working in the state after graduation, and he thought that he should be eligible for a waiver of the out-of-state fees. Question 4. Example answer. The studies by Savage Rumbaugh and colleagues with Kanzi, a bonobo chimpanzee, demonstrates progress in research on primate communication. Although the experiments confirm that auditory speech communication can't happen because of the different vocal tracts between species, they also prove that primates can communicate using sign language and symbols. In fact, Kanzi learned more than 350 symbols on a keyboard and on flashcards, understood 3,000 spoken English words, and 
and he was able to respond to spoken commands. So the research substantiates the information in the reading passage that、um, vocal organs and not intelligence they inhibit communication between primates and humans. Question five. Example answer. The problem is that the woman has only 15 minutes between classes, but it takes 20 minutes to walk from the chemistry lab to Hamilton Hall, where Professor Johnson's class is held. So she'd like to take the class with Johnson, but she'd be late. Um, her friend suggests that she buy a bike, but her concern is that she'd need a license and would have to store the bike somewhere at night. The other recommendation is is to ask Dr. Johnson for permission to enter the class five minutes late. So I think the woman should talk with the professor first. Her friend says he's approachable, and he might give her permission to be late for class. The first five minutes in a class is usually just business anyway, taking attendance and handing back papers, so she wouldn't miss much. And if he refuses, then she can always resort to the other alternative: she can buy a bike and a license, and she can find a place to store it. Question six, example answer. The habitable zones an area in which life can develop. There are several requirements, including an energy source and a chemical solvent that retains its liquid form. Okay, that means that the moon or the planet where life may develop has to be close enough to the energy source, probably a star, close enough that the solvent will remain a liquid. Outside the habitable zone, it would freeze or boil, depending on whether it was far away or too close to the star. In the case of Earth, the sun supplied the energy, and water was the chemical solvent. So, for life to evolve in ways similar to our own, the habitable zone would have to fall between Venus and Mars. But modern scientists are questioning whether the forces of gravity on larger planets might not generate enough energy to heat up the cores of the moons that orbit them. Now, if that's the case, then there could be habitable zones at a great distance from Venus. Which was the previously determined limit for habitable zone in our solar system? Review writing section, question one, lecture. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic as the passage you have just read. Although the dominant argument for global warming is that a majority of scientists support the model, well, any scientist would have to agree that consensus is a false proof of a scientific theory. Why? Because only one contradictory piece of empirical evidence is sufficient to refute a theory. That is to quote Richard Feynman: "The exception proves that the rule is wrong." That's the core of the scientific method, and many scientists with credentials equal to those of the proponents of global warming have put forward objections to the models that argue the global warming issue. To cite only one example, Linzen and Choi have measured changes in the outgoing long-wave radiation from the top of the atmosphere during periods of warming, and their findings directly contradicted the global warming model because the increased carbon dioxide didn't block outgoing long-wave radiation. Even the latest IPCC report acknowledges that the models don't simulate clouds well, and that's where the main uncertainties lie. So there isn't a consensus even among the proponents of the global warming models. Now let's look at the satellite data that supposedly proves the theory. In a joint study by the University of Alabama with NASA, in their study, they found a huge discrepancy between the forecast by the United Nations using computer models and the actual amount of heat that's trapped, especially over the oceans. In fact, the NASA data show that the models put forward for the past 25 years have consistently predicted more heat being trapped than real-world satellite data actually records. Finally, we must examine the primary explanation for the difference between the climate change in global average temperature that global warming has predicted, and the much lower change in global average temperature that we've experienced. Now, according to a model by von Schuchman, the missing heat is in the ocean at depths of about 2,000 meters. But the problem here is that the top of the ocean is cooling. So, how can the bottom be warming? And furthermore, we should see a hot spot close to the tropics because more water should have evaporated to this part of the atmosphere, and would have caused rapid warming if the models were accurate. But again, this doesn't conform to the scientific data. Quiz thing section. Now listen to a lecture on the same topic as the passage you have just read.
Although there's a great deal of excitement about the Stonehenge Riverside project, I'm less enthusiastic about it than many of my colleagues. Here's why. The theory that the monument was constructed as a burial site rests on three assumptions. First, the researchers report that they've found human remains, suggesting that ritual cremations and burials were performed at, at the site. But this discovery isn't new. We've known about the remains since the first excavations at the site more than 200 years ago. Because people were buried in Stonehenge, it doesn't necessarily follow that the site was constructed for that purpose. Previous research studies have noted the evidence of burials, but haven't come to the same conclusion. Second, let's consider the blue stones that stand in front of the larger Sarsen stones. Clearly, since these stones aren't native to the area and had to be carried long distances from quarry sites as far as 250 miles away, well, that's convincing evidence that they served an important purpose but what that purpose is, well, that remains unclear. Yes, they've been associated with burials. Still, some studies believe that the stones were important for their acoustical properties. And when blue stones along the Karn Menon Ridge were tested, a high proportion of them would actually ring when struck. So any number of rituals, including but not limited to burials, could have been enhanced by ancient music. Other studies maintain that the blue stones held a magical purpose and were thought to aid in the healing of people recovering from illness or injury. So instead of a burial site, Stonehenge could have been a healing site. The discovery of small pieces of blue stones chipped from the originals and scattered throughout the site might indicate that prehistoric people who made the pilgrimage to Stonehenge carried small pieces of the magical stones with them. And the burials there may have been secondary to their attempt to find a cure. In other words, some died in the effort to be healed. Finally, we have to consider the artifacts, specifically the stone mace, which was certainly an object that belonged to a person of high rank. But here's the problem. The mace is one object, and not enough artifacts have been located in addition to this one exciting find for us to draw conclusions. Furthermore, Stonehenge has been subjected to so many excavations and so much theft that it would be difficult to determine who was buried within the stone circles. Practice activities from Chapter 3. Activity 2. Example. Kathy aced her computer science class? One. Tuition at private colleges is more? Two. You took the prerequisites last year? Three. You lost the handouts? Four. Your laptop crashed? Five. You read the articles already? Six. Ron skipped class yesterday? Seven. The review session was productive? Eight. You sat in the front of the room and weren't called on? Nine. Dr. Graham grades his tests on the curve? Ten. Your brand new book bag fell apart? Activity 3. Example. You mean Carol doesn't want to live off campus? One. 
You mean you lent your notes to someone? Two. You mean you're auditing the course? Three. You mean I could have turned in my paper tomorrow? Four. You mean you crammed for the biology final? Five. You mean you wrote the first draft in one night? Six. You mean you dropped the class because it was too hard? Seven. You mean your request for an extension was denied? Eight. You mean all the lower division classes are full? Nine. You mean you know someone who plagiarized? Ten. You mean Bill is only a sophomore? Activity. Example. So Bill did apply to be a TA. One. So you did graduate with a degree in music theory. Two. So Jane is beginning her studies. Three. So you did speak with the dean. Four. So you do read the assignments after all. Five. So you are going to the snack bar after class. Six. So you did listen to Ken's report. Seven. So your roommate did pull another all-nighter. Eight. So you did complete fifteen credit hours last summer. Nine. So Dr. Peterson did let you take a makeup test. Ten. So you did bring your library card with you. Activity five. Example. You're going to take an elective in art appreciation, right? One. Dana transferred to State University, right? Two. Pat has a student ID number, doesn't she? Three. You got your transcripts, didn't you? Four. Bill took an incomplete in sociology last semester, didn't he? Five. You're an undergrad, right? Six. Gary was expelled because he cheated, right?
Seven. You signed up for extra credit, right? Eight. Sue got caught up over vacation, didn't she? Nine. The test was all fill in the blanks, right? Ten. Doctor Mitchell hasn't handed back your exam yet, has he? Activities. Example. Did you say you're on probation? One. Did you say there are fees for using the recreational facilities? Two. Did you say you couldn't find the admissions office? Three. Did you say you might have flunked the test? Four. Did you say you were charged a fine for parking there? Five. Did you say you graduated before the tuition hike? Six. Did you say you passed all of the pop quizzes? Seven. Did you say there are no vacancies in married student housing? Eight. Did you say there's no shuttle on Sundays? Nine. Did you say you've lived in a dorm for four years? Ten. Did you say Diane dropped out after her junior year? Activity, one. If I were you, I'd apply for an assistantship. Two. You could audit the course if you don't need the credit. Three. You'd better study this weekend, or you'll get behind in English. Four. You could take an excused absence in your Friday class so we could leave early. Five. You should withdraw so you won't have failing grades on your transcript. Six. You could meet Ken in the student union before the concert. Seven. Dana should apply for the work study position next fall. Eight. You should select your group project before midterm. Nine. If you want to check out books for your research paper, you'd better go to the library soon. Ten. You should plan to include the price of room and board in your budget. Activity 
Listening task one. Hi, Jane. How's it going? Good. You? Same old problem. My roommate is driving me crazy. But I thought you lived in a dorm. I do. Oh, then why don't you see your resident advisor? Been there, done that. I even went to the head resident. Really? And it didn't help? Nope. He says that we should work it out between the two of us. Wow. How do you do that when he's always partying in the room? I know. I keep waiting for him to flunk out. He's on probation, right? Again. He cuts class. I never see him doing any homework, but he crams for his finals and always seems to just get by. I'm so sorry. I suppose you could go to the study lounge or the library to study, but you're probably already doing that. I am, but it's not very convenient. I mean, I have all of my stuff in my room, but now I have to pack it up every time I want to study. And then you have to pack it all up again when you want to go back to your room. That's about the size of it. Are you getting behind? Not really, but I have a scholarship, so I have to keep my GPA up. And I'm a senior. You're a senior? Well, then, you need to start thinking about graduate school. I've already applied, but I need to submit this quarter's grades before they make a decision. So you really must be hitting the books. What can I do to help? Not much. But thanks for listening. Activity 9. Speaking Task 3. Are you going on the community service trip over spring break? I never go anywhere on break. I just visit my family for a few days and then come back and get ready for the next semester. I know, but this is different. It seems made to order for you. Are you serious? I don't drink, I don't like the beach, and I don't have the money to waste on airfare and hotels. That's what I mean. This spring break trip isn't about any of that. It's a community service trip. Look, you work with a team on a project in a low income area. You're minoring in social work, aren't you? Yeah. So you can see why I thought you might be interested. Actually, that does sound interesting. And I think it's a great idea. Spring break is so wild and crazy for a lot of my friends. Maybe this kind of alternative will attract some of the people who just want to get away from campus and do something different before they start another term. I was thinking about going or at least checking it out over at student services. Yeah, but it would be expensive. Unless the community is close by. No, here's the thing. A grant pays for your transportation and your living expenses, so there aren't any fees. You just have to be willing to work. What kind of work is it? Do you know? Not exactly. Some of the projects that were funded in the past have served senior citizens, and I'm pretty sure that there was tutoring for kids. Now you've really got me interested. I thought you would be. We should go over to student services to get a few more details, like where they're planning to go and what projects are funded. I think Professor Keller has his office hours now, and he's the one who's organizing the trip. Well, sure. I'm free right now until my next class at two. That ought to give us plenty of time. Okay, then. And if it doesn't work out for me to go, I think it's a great idea to give people an alternative to. to going crazy on some beach with a bunch of strangers from other colleges. That's never been my thing. Activity Speaking Task 5. Hi, Linda. I was hoping I might run into you today. Really? Yeah. I wanted to ask you for. I wanted some advice. Oh, okay. So, you have Dr. Jackson for your academic advisor, don't you? Uh huh. He's the advisor for most of the biology majors. I know. And he's my advisor, too. But. I'm just having problems communicating with him. I mean, he's nice and everything, but I feel like he just doesn't listen to me. And I leave the meetings thinking that I didn't get done what I needed to do. Do you ever feel like that? I can't say that I do, but it's a problem for sure if that's what's happening to you. Have you ever just had a serious talk about this with him? That's what I'd do. I've tried, but I'm just not getting through. I'm so frustrated. Well, you could request another advisor. I think Dr. Chi advises biology majors. I thought about that, but if I change advisors, then I'll have to sign up for a couple of my upper division courses with Dr. Jackson, and he might resent it that I wanted a different advisor. Besides, he's on the committee for my thesis. 
I don't think he'd mind all that much. He has a lot of graduate students to advise. Listen, you could make an appointment to talk with him before he finds out about the change, and you could give him some reason that isn't personal, like your schedule makes it hard to see him during his office hours or something. I could say that, but what if he offers to see me at a different time? Right. Well, that could happen, but I don't think so. Act 12. Example. Listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. 1. Listen to part of a lecture in a business class. 2. Listen to part of a lecture in a music appreciation class. 3. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. 4. Listen to part of a lecture in an anthropology class. 5. Listen to part of a lecture in an engineering class. 6. Listen to part of a lecture in a linguistics class. 7. Listen to part of a lecture in an art history class. 8. Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. 9. Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. 10. Listen to part of a lecture in a history class. Activity. Example. Okay then, let's get started. Uh, today we're going to talk about the biosphere. One. I have several slides of mosaic art, mostly from the fifth century. Two. Right. So, last time, we were discussing uh, multinational companies. Today, we're going to look at global companies. Three. Well, today's lecture is about light years. Four. So, if you read the chapter in your textbook, the one about insurance, then you have some background for today's lecture. Five. Although Malthus's theory of population is still important, I'm going to share a different approach with you today called demographic transition. Six. Okay, then. Let's begin our discussion of marshland habitats. Seven. Sorry about the mix-up with our classroom on the schedule. I'm glad you found us. So, this will be the room we'll be using for the rest of the semester. Okay, then. Let's get on with our discussion of igneous rocks. Eight. From your syllabus, you know that today we're talking about adobe construction, specifically how it can be adapted to modern architecture. Nine. Let's ask ourselves this simple question. How does an antibiotic make you well? Ten. All right. We've been talking about reptiles. Now let's turn our attention to amphibians. Activity. Listen to the beginning of a lecture in a linguistics class. Good morning. Well, we have a lot to do today, so let's get going. If you're caught up with your, your, your reading assignments, you've already read the article on the three types of language, but... Before we go on with the discussion, I want to take a few minutes to compare them. Okay, standard language first. That's language that's comprehended, used, and considered acceptable by most speakers. I mean, native speakers. So definitions of words and phrases in standard language, they're found in the dictionary. 
They can be used in both formal and informal situations, settings, and this is important. Standard language is appropriate in both speech and writing. I'd say that all of these characteristics combine to make standard language. Well, let's just say that it's the permanent core of a language. That brings us to colloquial language, which is included in dictionaries, but colloquial language is marked, and usually it's a colloquial idiom. So these patterns of colloquial language are understood and used and accepted in informal exchanges and in well people use them in informal situations but they're not really considered appropriate in formal settings. Did I say that colloquial language is more prevalent in speech than in writing? That's important. And the key point in the article was that colloquial language becomes so much part of the culture that at some point it often evolves into standard language. So you can compare an earlier dictionary with a recent dictionary and that will what well, you can see how some phrases that are marked as colloquial colloquial language lose that designation in later editions of the same dictionary. Okay. So you can see that colloquial idioms last a long time, either remaining popular in colloquial speech or as I said it can evolve into standard language and become a permanent part of the language. But that's very different from slang expressions because and this is the key point. Slang is usually a temporary phenomenon. It's used by some speakers or groups in informal situations and they're much more common in speech than they are in writing. Sometimes they're included in a dictionary but uh, they're always clearly marked as slang and when you check later editions of the dictionary quite often the slang expression is no longer included because it's out of style now let's consider the three types of language together and uh, i want you to think of them on a continuum from most to least formal so if we do that colloquial language would have to go between standard and slang so the slang is often relegated to a temporary fad and standard language contains the stable elements of the language and colloquial language has the potential to become a permanent part of the language <laughs> but it might not i think it's interesting that most native speakers will use all three types of language and they'll use them all appropriately without thinking about it in fact only a few speakers will be able to analyze their speech and writing using the labels that the author identified in the article. That said, let's get out the article for today's discussion and activity. Listen to the beginning of a lecture in a sociology class as you read the transcript. The professor is discussing status and roles. Status refers to uh, a position in society or or in a group but there are really two types of status ascribed status and achieved status okay in ascribed status the status is automatic so you don't have a choice in other words it's an involuntary status and some examples that come to mind are status because of race or sex not much you can do about that on the other hand achieved status requires some effort and there's a choice involved for instance, a marriage partner or the type of education or for that matter the length of time in school. Well, these are choices, uh, achievements, and so they fall under the category of achieved status. So that brings us to the status set. A status set is the combination of all statuses that an individual has. Well, me, for example, I'm a professor but I'm also a husband and a father and a son since my mother's still living. So in each of these statuses I have certain behaviors that are expected because of the status. Okay, all of the behaviors are roles. I mean, a role is the behavior expected because of status. Okay, back to status set. All of the statuses, husband, father son professor combine to form the status set and each of the statuses have certain expectations let me use that professor status again so as a professor i have a teaching role and i have to prepare classes that's expected i also advise students grade assignments and evaluate my students but this role is a, but this role is a very different expectations as a researcher I, I have to design studies, 
raise funds for grants, and uh, then perform the research. And, and, and finally, I write articles and reports. So I think you see what I mean. But one more thing, and this is important. Sometimes role conflict can occur. Let me say that again. Role conflict. And that means that meeting the expectations for one role will cause problems for an individual who's trying to meet other expectations in a different role. Okay, let's say that one of my students is dating my daughter. <laughs> I don't recommend this. But anyway, I may have role strain that could even develop into role conflict because it will be difficult for me to meet the expectations for my role as teacher. And uh, when the student comes to my house, I'll have to remember my status as father and my role that requires me to welcome a guest into my home and, well, form an opinion about someone who wants to take my daughter out on a date. The textbook actually has... Activity. Listen to some sentences from college lectures. Take notes as quickly as you can. 1. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gave women the right to vote, beginning with the elections of 1920. 2. In a suspension bridge, there are two towers with one or more flexible cables firmly attached at each end. 3. A perennial is any plant that continues to grow for more than two years, as for example trees and shrubs. 4. Famous for innovations in punctuation, typography, and language, Edward Estlin Cummings, known to us as E.E. E. Cummings, published his collected poems in 1954. 5. Absolute zero, the temperature at which all substances have zero thermal energy and thus the lowest possible temperatures is unattainable in practice. 6. Because Columbus, Ohio is considered a typical metropolitan area, it's often used for market research to test new products. 7. The cacao bean was cultivated by the Aztecs, not only to drink, but also as currency in their society. 8. The blue whale is the largest known animal, reaching a length of more than 100 feet, which is five times its size at birth. 9. Ontario is the heartland of Canada, both geographically and, I would say, historically as well. 10. Nuclear particles, called hadrons, which include the proton and neutron, are made from quarks, very odd particles that have a slight electrical charge but that cannot exist alone in nature. 8. Listen to some sentences from college lectures. Take notes by drawing diagrams. 1. A filament is the stalk of a stamen. 2. There are three factors that determine whether a credit applicant's a good risk: character, capacity, and capital. Three. In photosynthesis, the chloroplasts in the leaf absorb energy from the sun and then convert carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water into carbohydrates. Four. It was in the Cenozoic era that Homo sapiens first appeared, which was only about 1.8 million years ago long after the Mesozoic era, perhaps 200 million years ago, 
when the dinosaurs were roaming the Earth, and even earlier, approximately 540 million years ago, well, that was the Paleozoic era, when there was an explosive evolution of marine life. Five. In the sense that it's used among sociologists, the overwhelming feeling or need to escape a situation immediately is known as panic. Six. The difference between slate and phyllite is the coarseness of the grain and the color, slate being much more fine, often gray and easily split along the cleavage, whereas phyllite tends to be more coarsely grained, rather lustrous in appearance and feel, and oh yes, uh, it can be gray, green, or even red. Seven. Regulatory genes, called homeotic genes, cause the body parts of animals to develop appropriately. Eight. There were two types of decorations on Renaissance structures. The cartouche, which was an ornamental panel in the form of a scroll or some type of document, and the graffito, which was a white surface with a black undercoating, and uh, the, the design was made by scraping the white to reveal the black. Nine. Ptolemy, a Greek living in Alexandria in the 2nd century AD. Ptolemy assumed that the Earth was at the center of the universe, a theory that was accepted until 1543, when Copernicus, a Polish cleric, proposed that the Sun was at the center and the planets, including the Earth, revolved around it. 10. The brain consistently sends out electrical waves during sleep, and there are two basic types. Slow waves, which are larger and more often occur at the beginning of the sleep cycle, and, and may be more important for physical recuperation, as compared with REM, or rapid eye movement waves, that are faster and probably occur three to five times in an eight-hour period, usually later in the sleep cycle. And we think that REM may be more effective in resting the brain than slow waves. 1. Because light travels faster than sound, lightning appears to go before thunder. 2. Congress looked up to Jefferson because of his intelligence and creativity. Three. The lower teeth in crocodiles stick out when their mouths are closed. Four. Some sponges look like plants. Five. The first census was carried out in Great Britain in 1801. Six. People who have gone through a traumatic event may have recurring images of it. Seven. In algebra, letters and other symbols stand for numbers. Eight. During periods of stress or excitement, the heart rate goes up and airways to the lungs become dilated. Nine. Theories of prehistory and early humans are constantly changing as we take into account the new evidence from archaeological finds. Ten. Dreams may have been the inspiration for the Surrealists to come up with their works of art. Activity. Adjectives. 
One, the temperature in many desert regions is not hot at night. Two, facial expressions may not be unique across cultures. Three. Obsidian is not dull because it cools too quickly for crystals to form. Four, not many musical instruments play louder than one hundred decibels, or softer than twenty decibels. Five, the people who have adapted to life at very at very high altitudes are usually not tall. Nouns. One, in many cities, people who are trying to sell their goods must have a license to set up their booths in public areas. Two, studies show that small animals that live indoors are a positive influence in elderly people's lives. Three. Staircases were an important feature of the palaces where the aristocracy lived, constructed during the Baroque period. Four. Global wind patterns are affected by the way that the Earth turns. Five. Education that includes two languages is more common in regions where language minorities live. Verbs. One. Unlike cast iron, pure wrought iron has no carbon. Two. Hypnosis causes a heightened state of suggestibility in a willing participant. Three, productivity increases when fewer employees are required to do the work. Four, normally the plasma in human blood is fifty to sixty percent of the total blood volume. Five, three fourths of the goods made in Canada for export are sold to the United States. Activity eight. One. According to a study by Professor Carter, and I quote, patients can lower their blood pressure by losing weight and decreasing their intake of salt. End quote. Two. According to Professor Jones, and I'm quoting here. Over 14 billion euros were introduced into the world economy in January 2002. End quote. Three. To quote a study in the Journal of Psychology, many people who have achieved their career ambitions by midlife are afflicted by depression. End quote. Four. According to the textbook, and I'm quoting here, an organ is a group of tissues capable of performing some special function. End quote. Five. According to Professor Stevens, and I quote, John Philip Sousa was the greatest composer of marches for bands. End quote. Six. In Professor Davison's opinion, and I quote, Ben Jonson may be the author of several plays attributed to William Shakespeare. End quote. Seven. Professor Davis said that, and I'm quoting here, statistical data can be very difficult to interpret because correlations are not causes. End quote. Eight. As Professor Gray puts it, and I quote, 
The Prime Minister serves at the pleasure of the Parliament. End quote. Nine. According to the reading passage, and I quote, moving water is the single most important factor in determining the surface features of the Earth. End quote. Ten. In Professor Russell's opinion, and I am quoting here, the most important quality for a scientist is the ability to make careful observations. End quote. Activ activity 30. 1. In his book, The Making of the President, Theodore White noted that the 1960 presidential debate was more like a press conference. According to White, Nixon proceeded as though he were engaged in a personal debate. In contrast, Kennedy spoke directly to the TV viewers. He estimated that Kennedy gained 2 million votes as a result. Two. Paul Cezanne believed that all forms in nature were based on geometric shapes. Cezanne identified the cone, sphere, and cylinder as the primary forms. He used outlining to emphasize these shapes. Three. Along with her husband, Marie Curie won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1903 for the discovery of radium. Curie then received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1911 for the isolation of pure radium. She was the first person to be awarded two Nobel Prizes. Four. Psychologist Eric Erickson proposed eight stages of personal development. Erickson claimed that psychological crises at each stage shaped the sense of self. He believed that development was a lifelong process. Five. Margaret Mead did her first fieldwork in Samoa in 1925. Mead's book, Coming of Age in Samoa, was a bestseller that was translated into many languages. She's still one of the most well-known anthropologists in the world. Mead believed that people in simple societies could provide valuable lessons for the industrialized world. Six. Leonardo da Vinci was the quintessential Renaissance man, a brilliant painter. Da Vinci was perhaps best remembered for his art. But he was also interested in mechanics, and his understanding of mathematics is clear in his use of perspective. Seven. Author Peter Drucker wrote Management Challenges for the 21st Century. In this book, Drucker proposed five transforming forces, he predicted that these trends will have major implications for the long-term strategies of companies. Eight. Friedrich Mohs devised a scale of hardness for 10 minerals. By assigning 10 to diamond, the hardest known mineral, Mohs was able to attribute relative values to all the other minerals. His scale is still useful in the study of minerals today. Nine. Maria Montessori proposed an educational model that has become known as the Montessori method. Montessori insisted that education should not be merely the transmission of knowledge, but the freedom to develop as a person. She felt her greatest success was achieved when a child began working independently. Ten. In collaboration with Louis Leakey, Jane Goodall spent years living with chimpanzees on the Gambe Reserve. Goodall imitated their behaviors and discovered that chimpanzees lived within a complex social organization. She was the first to document chimpanzees making and using tools, and she also identified 20 different sounds that were part of a communication system. Activity 1 Listen to part of a lecture in a botany class. The acacia is a genus of trees and shrubs of the mimosa family that originated in Australia 
and has long been used in building simple mud and stick structures there. The acacia is called a wattle in Australia, and the structures are made of wattle stuck together with daub, which is a kind of mud adobe. Now this is interesting. The acacia is related to the family of plants known as legumes, and I'm sure you remember that legumes include peas, beans, lentils, peanuts, and pods with bean-like seeds. Some acacias actually produce edible crops, but other acacia varieties are valued for the sticky resin called gum arabic or gum acacia, and that is used widely in medicines, foods, and perfumes. A few varieties are grown for the dark, dense wood, which is just excellent for making pianos, or for the bark that is very rich in tannin, a dark, acidic substance used to cure the hides of animals to make leather. Let's see. Nearly 500 species of acacia have been identified and categorized and proven capable of survival in hot and generally arid parts of the world. But only a dozen of the 300 Australian varieties seem to thrive in the southern United States. Most acacia imports are low, spreading trees, but of these, only three flower. The Bailey acacia has fern-like silver leaves and small, fragrant flowers, ar arranged in um, in sort of rounded clusters. The silver wattles, similar to the Bailey acacia, but it grows about twice as high. And the Sydney golden wattle is bushy with broad, flat leaves, and it's the golden wattle with the showy, bright yellow blossoms. Okay. The black acacia is also called the black wood. It has dark green foliage, and the blossoms are rather ordinary. But besides being a popular ornamental tree, the black acacia is considered valuable for its dark wood, which is used in making furniture and musical instruments. I think I mentioned that acacias are used to make pianos. Well, a piano made of black acacia is highly prized in the musical world. Now. Some of you may have heard that the acacia's unique custom of blossoming in February in the United States has something to do with its Australian origins, but that just isn't so. It isn't the date; it's the quality of light that makes a difference for the flowering cycle of a tree. As you know, in the southern hemisphere, the seasons are reversed, and February, which is winter time in the United States, is summer time in Australia. Actually, however, The pale yellow blossoms appear in August in Australia. So, whether it grows in the northern or the southern hemisphere, the acacia blossoms in winter. Activity three: Listen to part of a lecture in a chemistry class. Although the purpose and techniques were often magical, alchemy was, in many ways, the predecessor of the modern science of chemistry. The fundamental premise of alchemy, derived from the best philosophical dogma and scientific practice of the time, and the majority of educated persons between 1400 and 1600, believed that alchemy had great merit. The earliest authentic works on European alchemy are those of the English monk Roger Bacon and the German philosopher Saint Albertus Magnus. In their treatises, they maintained that gold was the perfect metal, and that inferior metals such as lead and mercury were removed by various degrees of imperfection from gold. They further asserted that these base metals could be transmuted to gold by blending them with a substance more perfect than gold. This elusive substance was referred to as the philosopher's stone. The process was called transmutation. Most of the early alchemists were artisans who were accustomed to keeping trade secrets and often resorted to cryptic terminology to record the progress of their work. The term "sun" was used for gold, "moon" for silver, and the five known planets for the base metals. This con this convention of substituting symbolic language attracted some mystical philosophers who compared the search for the perfect metal. With the struggle of humankind for the perfection of the soul, the philosophers began to use the artisans' terms in the mystical literature that they produced. Thus, by the 14th century, alchemy had developed two distinct groups of practitioners: 
the laboratory alchemist and the literary alchemist. Both groups of alchemists continued to work throughout the history of alchemy, but of course, it was the literary alchemist who was more likely to produce a written record. Therefore, much of what is known about the science of alchemy is derived from philosophers rather than from the alchemists who labored in laboratories. Despite centuries of experimentation, laboratory alchemists failed to produce gold from other materials. However, they gained wide knowledge of chemical substances, discovered chemical properties, and invented many of the tools and techniques that are used by chemists today. Many laboratory chemists earnestly devoted themselves to the scientific discovery of new compounds and reactions and therefore must be considered the legitimate forefathers of modern chemistry. They continued to call themselves alchemists, but they were becoming true chemists. Activity 4. Listen to part of a lecture in an English class. Few have influenced the development of American English to the extent that Noah Webster did. After a short career in law, he turned to teaching, but he discovered how inadequate the available school books were for the children of a new and independent nation. In response to the need for truly American textbooks, Webster published A Grammatical Institute of the English Language, a three-volume work that consisted of a speller, a grammar, and a reader. The first volume, which was generally known as the American Spelling Book, was so popular that eventually it sold more than 80 million copies and provided him with a considerable income for the rest of his life. Can you imagine that? Anyway, in 1807, Noah Webster began his greatest work, An American Dictionary of the English Language. In preparing the manuscript, he devoted ten years to the study of English and its relationship to other languages, and seven more years to the writing itself. Published in two volumes in 1828, an American Dictionary of the English Language has become the recognized authority for usage in the United States. Webster's purpose in writing it was to demonstrate that the American language was developing distinct meanings, pronunciations, and spellings from those of British English. He's responsible for advancing many of the simplified spelling forms that distinguish American English from British. Webster was the first author to gain copyright protection in the United States by being awarded a copyright for the American Spelling Book, and he continued to lobby over the next 50 years for the protection of intellectual properties, that is, for authors' rights. By the time that Webster brought out the second edition of his dictionary, which included 70,000 entries instead of the original 38,000, the name Webster had become synonymous with American dictionaries. It was this second edition that served as the basis for the many revisions that have been produced by others, ironically, under the uncopyrighted Webster name. Activity 35. Listen to part of a lecture in an engineering class. The question has often been posed, why were the Wright brothers able to succeed in an effort at which so many others had failed? Well, many explanations have been mentioned, but uh, three reasons are most often cited, and I tend to agree with them. First, the Wright brothers were a team. Both men worked congenially and cooperatively, read the same books, located and shared information, talked incessantly about the possibility of manned flight, and, and served as constant sources of inspiration and encouragement to each other. So, to put it quite simply, two geniuses are better than one genius. Second, both the brothers were glider pilots, so unlike some other engineers who experimented with the theories of flight, Orville and Wilbur Wright experienced the practical aspects of aerodynamics by building and flying gliders. And this may surprise you, they even flew in kites. Now, each craft they built was slightly superior to the last because they incorporated the knowledge that they had gained from previous failures to adjust the next design. They had realized fairly early on from their experiments that the most serious challenge in man flight would be stabilizing and maneuvering the aircraft once it was airborne. So, uh, while others concentrated their efforts on the problem of achieving lift for takeoff, 
The Wright brothers were focusing on developing a three-axis control for guiding their aircraft. By the time that the brothers started to build an airplane, they were already among the world's best glider pilots, and they knew about the problems of riding the air firsthand. In addition, the Wright brothers had designed more effective wings for their airplane than anyone else had been able to engineer. Using a wind tunnel, they tested more than 200 different wing designs, recording the effects of slight variations in shape on the pressure of air on the wings. The data from these experiments allowed the Wright brothers to construct a superior wing for their aircraft. But, you know, in spite of these advantages, the Wright brothers still might not have succeeded if they hadn't been born at precisely the right time in history. Attempts to achieve manned flight in the early 19th century were doomed because the steam engines that powered the aircrafts were just too heavy in proportion to the power that they produced. But by the end of the 19th century, when the brothers were experimenting with engineering options, a relatively light internal combustion engine had already been invented, and they were able to bring the ratio of weight to power within acceptable limits for flight. Activities. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. The protozoans, minute aquatic creatures, each of which consists of a single cell of protoplasm, constitute a classification of the most primitive forms of animal life. The very name protozoan indicates the scientific understanding of the animals. Proto means first or primitive, and zoa refers to the animal. They are fantastically diverse, but three major groups may be identified on the basis of their motility. The mastigophora have one or more long tails that they use to propel themselves forward. The ciliata, which use the same basic means for locomotion as the mastigophora, have a larger number of short tails. The sarcodina, which include amoebae, float or row themselves about on their crusted bodies. In addition to their form of movement, several other features discriminate among the three groups of protozoans. For example, at least two nuclei per cell have been identified in the ciliata, usually a large nucleus that regulates growth but decomposes during reproduction, and a smaller one that contains the genetic code necessary to generate the large nucleus. So, all of this seems very straightforward to this point, but now we're going to complicate the picture. Chlorophyll, which is the green substance in plants, is also found in the bodies of some protozoans, enabling them to make at least some of their own food from water and carbon dioxide. Sounds like photosynthesis, doesn't it? But protozoans are animals, right? And plants are the life forms that use photosynthesis. Okay, well, protozoans are not considered plants because... Unlike pigmented plants, to which some protozoans are otherwise almost identical, they don't live on simple organic compounds. Their cells demonstrate all of the major characteristics of the cells of higher animals, such as eating, breathing, and reproducing. Now, many species of protozoans collect into colonies, physically connected to one another, and responding uniformly to outside stimuli. Current research into this phenomenon along with investigations carried out with advanced microscopes, may necessitate a redefinition of what constitutes protozoans, even calling into question the basic premise that they have only one cell. Nevertheless, with the current data available, almost 40,000 species of protozoans have been identified. No doubt, as technology improves methods of observation, better models of classification of these simple single cells will be proposed. Activity 7. Listen to part of a lecture in an anthropology class. The development of the horse has been recorded from the beginning through all of its evolutionary stages to the modern form. It is perhaps one of the most complete and well-documented chapters of paleontological history. Fossil finds provide us not only with detailed information about the horse itself, but also with valuable insights into the migration of herds and even evidence for the speculation about the climatic conditions that could have instigated their migratory behavior. 
Now, geologists believe that the first horses appeared on Earth about 60 million years ago, as compared with only 2 million years ago for the appearance of human beings. There's evidence of early horses on both the American and European continents. But it's been documented that almost 12 million years ago, at the beginning of the Pliocene age, a horse about midway through its evolutionary development crossed a land bridge where the Bering Strait's now located. It traveled from Alaska into the grasslands of Asia and all the way to Europe. So this early horse was a hipparion, about the size of a modern-day pony with three toes and specialized cheek teeth for grazing. In Europe, the hipparion encountered another less advanced horse called the Anchitheres, which had previously invaded Europe by the same route, probably during the Miocene period. Less developed and smaller than the hipparion, the Anchitheres was eventually completely replaced by it. By the end of the Pleistocene age, both the Anchitheres and the Hipparion had become extinct in North America, where they originated, as fossil evidence clearly demonstrates. In Europe, they evolved into the larger and stronger animal that's very similar to the horse as we know it today. For many years, this horse was probably hunted for food by early tribes of human beings. Then the qualities of the horse that would have made it a good servant were recognized, mainly its strength and speed. It was time for the horse to be tamed, used as a draft animal at the dawning of agriculture, and then ridden as need for transportation increased. It was the descendant of this domesticated horse that was brought back across the ocean to the Americas by European colonists. Activity 38. Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. Okay, then. Let's talk about human memory which was formerly believed to be rather inefficient as compared with, for example, computers. But we're finding that we probably have a much more sophisticated mechanism than we'd originally assumed. Researchers approaching the problem from a variety of points of view have all concluded that there's a great deal more stored in our minds than has been generally supposed. Here's what I mean. Dr. Wilder Penfield, a Canadian neurosurgeon, proved that by stimulating their brains electrically, he could elicit the total recall of complex events in his subjects' lives. Even dreams and other minor events supposedly forgotten for many years suddenly emerged in detail. The memory trace is the term for whatever forms the internal representation of the specific information about an event stored in the memory. So the trace is probably made by structural changes in the brain. But the problem is that the memory trace isn't really subject to direct observation because it's, it's more a theoretical construct that we use to speculate about how information presented at a particular time can cause performance at a later time. So most theories include the strength of the memory trace as a variable in the degree of learning, retention, and retrieval possible for a memory. One theory is that the fantastic capacity for storage in the brain is the result of an almost unlimited combination of interconnections between brain cells stimulated by patterns of activity. And repeated references to the same information supports recall. Or to say that another way, improved performance is the result of strengthening the chemical bonds in the memory. Now here's the interesting part. Psychologists generally divide memory into at least two types, short-term memory and long-term memory, which combine to form what we call working memory. Short-term memory contains what we're actively focusing on at any particular time, but items aren't retained longer than 20 or 30 seconds without verbal rehearsal. We use short-term memory when we look up a telephone number and repeat it to ourselves until we can place the call. In contrast, long-term memory can store facts, concepts, and experiences after we stop thinking about them. All conscious processing of information, as in problem-solving, for example, involves both short-term and long-term memory. As we repeat, rehearse, and recycle information, the memory trace is strengthened allowing that information to move from short-term memory 
to long term memory. Activity 9. Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. A geyser is the result of underground water under the combined conditions of high temperatures and increased pressure beneath the surface of the Earth. Now, temperature rises about maybe one degree Fahrenheit for every 60 feet under the Earth's surface. And we know that pressure also increases with depth, water that seeps down in cracks and fissures. So when the water, when the water reaches very hot rocks in the Earth's interior, it becomes heated to the temperature of, let's say, 290 degrees. Okay then. Water under pressure can remain liquid at temperatures above the normal boiling point, but in a geyser, the weight of the water nearer the surface exerts so much pressure on the deeper water that the water at the bottom of the geyser reaches much higher temperatures than the water at the top. And as the deep water becomes hotter, and consequently lighter, it suddenly rises to the surface and shoots out of the ground in the form of steam and hot water. In turn, The explosion agitates all of the water in the geyser reservoir. And what do you think happens then? More explosions. So immediately afterward, the water goes back into the underground reservoir. It starts to heat up again, and the whole process repeats itself. So, in order to function, then, a geyser must have a source of heat, a reservoir where water can be stored until the temperature rises to an unstable point, an opening through which the hot water and steam can escape, and underground channels for resupplying water after an eruption. Now, favorable conditions for geysers exist in regions of geologically recent volcanic activity, especially in areas of more than average precipitation. For the most part, geysers are located in three regions of the world New Zealand, Iceland, and the Yellowstone Park area of the United States. I'd say that the most famous geyser in the world is Old Faithful in Yellowstone. It erupts every hour, rising to a height of 125 to 170 feet and expelling more than 10,000 gallons of hot water during each eruption. Old Faithful earned its name because, unlike most geysers, It's never failed to erupt on schedule even once in 80 years of observation. Activity 5. Now listen to a conversation on the same topic. Hi, Jan. Have you heard about the new summer schedule? No. Is there a change? Just saw it in the campus news this morning. No Friday or weekend classes. Really? Why is that? Energy. The lights and air conditioning will be turned off for three days to cut down on energy consumption during the hottest months. Well, I'm the first one in line to support conservation of resources, but what about the people who are working during the summer and depend on weekend courses to keep on track with their part time degree programs? I know my sister always takes those intensive weekend classes. She starts Friday after work and gets out about 10 at night. Then she's in class all day Saturday and Sunday from 8 till 8, with breaks, of course. It works out to be about 24 hours on campus. And then she has 12 hours of online activities for each three hour course. I think she actually took three courses like that last summer. Not this year. I wonder what they'll do about that. Probably move those classes into the online curriculum. But that's really too bad for the people who are already taking a lot of online courses, because it's good to interact one on one with the professor and the other students. Sure, I can see that. Then, when you take the online courses, you kind of know people, and, and it's more like being in a regular class. Exactly. Oh, and did I mention the motion sensitive lighting and that thermostats will be set at 78 during the day and air conditioning will be turned off completely at 8 o'clock at night? I get the motion sensitive lighting, but wonder if the shutoff is really efficient. My thought exactly. It takes a lot of power to crank up the air conditioner after the building has heated up. I mean, I know it'll be cooler during the night, but still, it'll require a power surge to get going in the morning. Well, you know more about this than I do since you're an engineering student, but won't that put a lot of pressure on the system campus wide if everything starts up at 8? Not just for one building. But for the whole campus power system. I'm not sure. You'd think that they would have considered that problem, but you never know till you actually try it out. 
So our energy conservation plan could cause power outages when everything starts up again after the weekend. Monday morning is going to be interesting around here this summer. Activity six. Now listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. People call it a bear, but the koala is really a marsupial. So it's much more like a kangaroo than it is like a bear. Here's what I mean. First, the koala has a gestation period of only about 35 days before it's born. Then, a tiny pink furless creature about 19 millimeters long makes its way from the birth canal into the mother's pouch, where it attaches itself to one of two nipples. So it stays in the pouch to complete its development, and six to seven months later, it pokes its head out and explores a short distance from the mother, jumping back into the pouch until it reaches eight months, when it's too big to fit. And for another four months, it rides on the mother's back or hangs from her stomach until it finally becomes independent at about one year old. By then, it's about the same size as a teddy bear and looks remarkably like one, with a furry, the furry coat, rounded ears, and a large nose to support its keen senses of smell and hearing. Native to Australia, the koala lives in trees and is a skillful climber. It sleeps in the branches during the day, and at night it combs the trees for its favorite meal, eucalyptus leaves. Activity 7. Now listen to part of a lecture in a general science class. The professor is talking about bottled water. Let's go through each of the points that were presented to promote the drinking of bottled water. Bottled water is healthier. Not always. In fact, as much as 40% of bottled water comes from city water supplies. Granted, the bottling companies filter the water and occasionally add some minerals, but just because the water is in a bottle or because it has an exotic name that evokes mountains, streams, and icebergs, that doesn't mean that the water is necessarily from a healthier source. It could be, but it's not guaranteed. And another thing, bottled water usually doesn't contain a high enough level of fluoride to improve dental health. In contrast, People who get their water from public water systems receive, flori receive fluoridated water, which has been proven to reduce tooth decay. Bottled water tastes better. Really? Well, the purest water is distilled water because all of the minerals and salts are removed. But without them, the water tastes flat. It's the sodium, calcium, magnesium, and chlorides that give water its good taste. The reason that tap water may taste funny is the higher level of chlorine, but if you put it in the refrigerator for a few hours without a lid, the chlorine taste will dissipate. And here's the real surprise. A recent study administered by the Swiss-based World Wildlife Fund asked the studio audience at the popular TV show Good Morning America to participate in a blind tasting that included two of the best-selling bottled waters, oxygenated water, and tap water from the New York City water system. And tap water received 45% of the vote. Yes, it's true that the plastic bottles, all 70 million per day in the United States alone, all of those bottles could be recycled because they're made of recyclable plastic. But unfortunately, only about 15% of them actually make it into the recycle bins, which leaves a whopping 85% or 59.5 million bottles per day that end up in landfills. Question. The woman expresses her opinion of the announcement. State her opinion and give the reasons that she gives for the opinion. Example response. The woman doesn't agree with the idea to shut down the campus for three days every week in order to conserve energy. Although she supports the conservation of resources, she thinks that the intensive weekend courses that will be, can that will be canceled are important, especially for working people like her sister. The online courses replacing them won't provide the personal interaction that weekend courses do for those who are already taking online classes. She concedes that the idea of motion sensors for lighting makes sense, but she isn't sure that turning off the power completely is an energy-efficient plan because power outages could occur when the power is turned on in all the buildings on campus at 8 o'clock Monday morning. Question. The professor describes a koala. Using information from both the reading and the lecture, explain why a koala would be considered a marsupial. Example response. 
A koala is a good example of a marsupial because it completes its embryotic development in its mother's pouch. It's hairy like other mammals, and it has a keen sense of smell and hearing, which are important to its nocturnal nature. Like all marsupials, a koala crawls from the birth canal to the mother's pouch and attaches itself to a nipple to nurse. It stays with the mother for about eight months until it's too big for the pouch, and then it begins independent life in trees, using its sensitive nose to feed on eucalyptus leaves at night. Activity Speaking Task 3 Now listen to a conversation on the same topic. Have you heard about the fee hike? Sure, everybody's talking about it. But it won't affect you, right? Because you're from Florida. Right. My fees will be the same as last year. But you're an out-of-state student, so that will mean... $360. That's 3%. Oh. Per semester. So really, it's $720 for the year. Just be glad you aren't an international student. Isn't their fee increase the same as out-of-state students? It is, if they're already enrolled. But if they're applying as new students, I mean, then they have to pay 5% more than last year. Well, I think this whole idea is not well thought out because part of your education is supposed to be exposure to new people as well as to new ideas. And if you punish out-of-state students and international students, then naturally, fewer of us will apply and attend. And that means that in-state students like you will have a very different experience. You'll just have a lot of people with the same background on campus. That's a really good point. My roommate is from India, and it's been great learning about her customs and her point of view on issues and events. Well, her fees will go up, but at the same rate as mine because she's already a student here. But I'll bet her family will give it some thought before they send her younger brothers and sisters. 5% is a lot. Question. The man expresses his opinion of the announcement. State his opinion and give the reasons he has for holding that opinion. Example response. The man disagrees with the increases in tuition and fees and tuition and fees for out-of-state students and international students. As an out-of-state student, he'll have to pay 3% more, that is, the same increase as continuing international students. But he emphasizes the fact that new international students will have to pay 5% more. So there will probably be a serious decline in that population on campus. And he says that it won't be good for the campus environment because so many students will have the same background. Speaking Task 4 Now that you have read the explanation of strategic business alliances in the reading, listen to part of a lecture on a similar topic. Okay. Now, I want you to think about two companies that have historically been in competition for the package delivery service in the United States. Well, the first to come to mind has to be the U.S. Postal Service, right? But now think fast delivery. For that, Federal Express is at the top of the list. But instead of viewing their relationship as totally competitive, these two companies struck an unprecedented strategic alliance several years ago. The U.S. Postal Service agreed to let Federal Express place package collection boxes at thousands of post offices throughout the United States, which was great for FedEx because they achieved an immediate national presence. But, in exchange, FedEx allowed the Postal Service to buy unused space on the Federal Express airplanes in order to carry first class, priority, and most importantly, express mail envelopes and packages, increasing the speed with which they could deliver the mail without purchasing aircraft. Moreover, by sharing websites to track their deliveries, both companies have been able to create a larger Internet presence. So why would these companies be willing to help each other? Probably the most commonly espoused explanation is that they're both battling fax, email, and other emerging messaging technologies, and their combined resources may result in survival and success for both of them against a common threat. And that fits in nicely with the whole concept of strategic alliances. But besides that, many countries, 
New Zealand, Sweden, Germany, and the Netherlands, to name only a few, these countries have ended the special government status that postal services have traditionally enjoyed, with all the benefits, including tax advantages and subsidies. So it may be that the U.S. Postal Service is trying to find alternatives to show progress before privatization ends its chance of survival. And Federal Express might be positioning itself to be the really big winner if the Postal Service goes up on the auction block at some time in the future. In other words, the real purpose of strategic alliances like this one may be to serve competing interests in the long run in an agreement that allows each company to retain its identity and dissolve the association when it's no longer advantageous. Question. Explain how the example that the professor provides demonstrates the concept of strategic alliances defined in the reading passage. Example response. An example of a strategic alliance is the agreement between the U.S. Postal Service and Federal Express in which the Postal Service allowed FedEx to place its depositories in a large number of post offices in exchange for the opportunity to buy space on FedEx airplanes. The Postal Service obtained transportation for their first class, priority, and express mail without purchasing aircraft. FedEx secured a national presence for their brand. All three key features of a strategic alliance were present in the agreement. First, both entities retained their individual identities. Second, the alliance provided for the companies to share resources for their mutual benefit and cooperate in the competitive arena against newer technologies. Third, the alliance, easily organized and easily terminated, could place each company in a more favorable position when business conditions change. In today. Now listen to part of a lecture in a business class. The professor is talking about vacation time. Many advantages have been cited for companies that offer paid vacation time to their employees. But when we look more closely at each of these arguments, they start to fall apart. In the first place, companies who give generous vacation time to employees are supposed to receive more control over absenteeism, especially the unexpected absence of an employee at a critical time. In reality, unexpected absences occur at about the same rate in companies with paid vacation time and in those without that benefit. Unfortunately, it's simply not possible to plan for the unexpected or to schedule emergencies around a planned vacation period. Next, let's look at the issues of health and productivity. Although there's some evidence that people who take vacations tend to be healthier, both mentally and physically, there's no assurance that the paid time away from work will be used for a refreshing holiday. More often than not, employees with paid vacation will use that time to accomplish a project at home, schedule an elective surgery, take care of an ailing relative, or some other activity that doesn't lend itself to returning rested and restored from the so-called vacation. In fact, in some studies, employees returning from paid vacations reported feeling more tired and stressed than before leaving. Okay then, what about vacation time as a recruitment strategy? That seems to be rather straightforward, but again, it really isn't. Because like most other contractual issues, one size doesn't fit all when it comes to offering benefits. Some highly talented employees are less interested in time off than they are in better health care for themselves and their families. Others want more money and fewer perks. And still others are just looking for a clear path for advancement and promotion. And being gone from the workplace isn't a good way to make that happen. So, yes, workers in the United States are at the bottom of the chart for paid vacation days. But it's hard to make the argument that giving employees time off is better for American companies. Summarize the main, po the main points in the lecture, and then explain how they cast doubt on the ideas in the reading passage. Activity 9. Example Speaking Task 3. Now listen to a conversation on the same topic. I know you think it's a hassle, 
but I'm really happy about the new security measures. You wouldn't believe the people who parade through our dorm in the middle of the night. And the scans will help that? Maybe. At least we'll know who's there. And people who just walk in from who knows where will have to get guest passes. Don't they have to do that now? Well, yes, but it isn't really enforced. And this looks like a serious plan. I'll give you that. And for students, well, how long does it take to scan a fingerprint at the door? True. It won't be any different from opening up your phone or tablet with your fingerprint. I hadn't thought about that. I guess it's just the time to go get your fingerprint scanned at the security office. Look, back to the issue of phones and tablets. You want to keep those secure. Why wouldn't you want to keep students secure? That's a point. It, st it stands to reason that someone who wants to steal something or even hurt someone, well, maybe they'll think about it if they have to scan their prints or leave their ID at the desk. I know I'm going to feel better about living in the dorm. Okay, I'm convinced. It isn't such a big deal to go to the security office. I can just stop by there when I'm in the student union the next time. But I hope there isn't a line a mile long. Question. The woman expresses her opinion of the announcement. State her opinion and the reasons that she has for having that opinion. Example response. The woman approves of the new security policy because it's a serious plan. It will be easy to use and it should be a deterrent to crime. She explains that the previous system that required a pass to enter the dorm wasn't enforced, but now, without a scan, it won't be possible to go in the door. She also points out that it's really easy, like scanning to access a secure mobile device. She argues that scanning a fingerprint will be a deterrent to theft and the dorms will be safer because it'll be better than a guest pass to keep track of everyone who's in the buildings. Example asked for. Now listen to part of a lecture in a linguistics class. The professor is talking about endangered languages. Today I want to give you an example of a language that unfortunately meets all the criteria to be considered an endangered language. Like many other Native American languages, Ojibwe, also known as Chippewa, is struggling to survive. A North American indigenous language of the Algonquin language family, Ojibwe, has traditionally been spoken in Canada and along the northern border of the United States. It was very important during the fur trading era in the Great Lakes region, to such an extent, in fact, that French traders often used Ojibwe to speak with other tribes. But although the total ethnic population still includes more than 200,000 people, and that number comes from self-identification, the people who claim Ojibwe tribal membership, well, of those 200,000, only about 30,000 still speak Ojibwe on any level of proficiency. And the number of children in the youngest generation who are fluent in Ojibwe is almost non-existent. In a study in 1995 of Ojibwe language usage in a three-state area consisting of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, Rosemary Christensen was able to locate only 500 fluent Ojibwe speakers. Of those speakers, most were elders over the age of 80, and none were under the age of 45. She found no children who were fluent in Ojibwe. Partly in response to this study and with funding from the Department of Health and Human Services, four preschools were opened in Minneapolis in 2006. In cooperation with the 100 remaining Ojibwe speakers in the area, immersion classrooms in Ojibwe began teaching young children in their ancestral language. Will it be too little too late? Only time will tell. As for now, Ojibwe remains on the endangered list, a language with an uncertain future. Question. The professor reports a study of the Ojibwa language. Explain why the study confirms that Ojibwa is an endangered language. Example response. Ojibwa is considered an endangered language because it meets all three criteria for that classification. First, few speakers are fluent in the language. In Christensen's study in 1995, only about 500 of the tribal members in the tri-state area studied were fluent speakers. Second, the average age of native speakers is older. Among the 500 fluent speakers, most were elders, 80 years of age or older. Finally, the percentage of speakers in the youngest generation is small. 
Among Ojibwe speakers, almost no children were fluent. Unfortunately, this study confirmed that Ojibwe is endangered, and despite efforts to teach the language in federally funded preschools, its future is very uncertain. Editing task one, integrated essay. Now listen to part of a lecture in an economics class. The professor is talking about home ownership. The reading passage lists three reasons to own a home, but recent changes in the economy persuade us to reassess the assumptions. First, we have to question whether owning a home is a sound investment in today's economy. Although it was once considered a strategy in the creation of wealth, it is now being re-examined. During recessions like the one recently experienced, the value of homes has dramatically fallen. So much so that many homeowners were paying a high mortgage for a home that was worth only half of its value at the time of the purchase. Whether owning a home that has depreciated in value so rapidly will be a sound investment long term, while、well, the verdict will have to wait for a decade to give us that kind of data, but short term for many homeowners, the plan to create wealth is a disappointment. The sharp increase in foreclosures and forced sales has also decreased the sense of security that homeowners once experienced. Struggling to pay a mortgage and the looming possibility that the property will be foreclosed leads to a loss of control and a sense of insecurity, the exact opposite of the anticipated stability that homeowners used to enjoy. A significant number of first-time owners report that they would prefer to rent. But don't know how to reverse their situation without losing their initial investment. As for the social benefits, the pressures associated with owning and maintaining a home are taking a toll on the psychological and physical health of homeowners. Many homeowners report that they're only one paycheck away from being unable to pay the costs of owning a home. The stress affects all of the family members, even the children, who seem to respond to the pressures by bringing home lower grades and by being less involved in school activities than was previously reported. So, as you see, times have changed. Summarize the main points in the lecture, and then explain how they cast doubt on the ideas in the reading passage. Activity. Speaking task three. Now listen to a conversation on the same topic. You're an honors student, aren't you? Yes. So I guess you've been over to Harkins Hall. Uh huh. It's pretty grim, but they aren't done yet, so maybe it will be okay. Always the optimist. How can a basement be better than the top floor of Anderson Hall? That was really a nice place to hang out. The view was phenomenal. It still is. It's just not our view anymore. That's why the faculty wanted it. Right. But you spend more time there than I do, so it doesn't matter so much to me. I just go over there when I need my advisor's signature for something. I, I haven't used the lounge that much. Well, since I live off campus, I'm there between classes, and I even eat my lunch there sometimes. There's always a chess game going, and I'm friends with a lot of the regulars. Then it's a big change for you. It is, and it bugs me that the new space is so inferior to what we had. I think they should have tried harder to find something better than a basement. It just communicates that the honors program isn't important. Oh, I don't know about that. I feel lucky to be in smaller classes and to be able to take graduate courses while I'm still an undergrad. Don't you? Sure, of course I do. But the lounge is supposed to be our place to meet up with other honors students. And besides, how do you think the advisors feel? Their offices are cramped and dark compared with the program offices that they had in Anderson. Of course, they can always use the faculty club when they want to. Unlike us. Listen, are you always so upbeat? It seems like you just take everything in stride. Pretty much, especially when it's something I can't change anyway. Question: The man expresses his opinion of the announcement. State his opinion and give the reasons that he gives for the opinion. Example response: The man isn't happy about the relocation of the honors program to Harkins Hall. Because the other location in Anderson Hall was larger and had a better view, 
He uses the lounge to hang out with friends and eat lunch because he lives off campus, and the new space isn't as nice. It's dark, small, and it doesn't have a view because it's in a basement. He feels that moving the honors program to an inferior space indicates that the program isn't very important to the college. Speak four. Now listen to a lecture in a biology class about the same topic. Peacocks are large, colorful birds known for their beautiful blue-green tail feathers, which they spread out in a distinctive fan. When extended, the fan tail represents more than 60 percent of the peacock's total body weight. Arched into a magnificent train, it surrounds the bird's back and spreads out onto the ground on either side. Female birds choose their mates according to the size, color, and quality of the feathered trains. In addition to the blue-green feathers, colorful eye markings of red and gold and many other colors enhance the beauty of individual birds and form very different patterns from one bird to another. Although the term peacock is commonly used to refer to both males and females, technically only the male is a peacock. The peahens watch the display in order to make a selection. In general, the more eye spots and the more evenly spaced their pattern, the more attractive a male peacock appears to the female. A large fan is also appealing. However, tails that are too big are considered too burdensome for mating. And as though the beautiful feathers and the graceful movements of the males were not enough, as they strut and perform an elaborate dance in front of their potential mates, while、well, these beautiful birds also communicate in very low-pitched mating calls that are produced by the vibrations of the feather train at a level of 20 hertz, far too low to be heard by the human ear, but just right for a peahen to notice. Question: The professor discusses peacocks. Explain how their behavior conforms to the usual rituals for courtship displays. Example response: Peacocks are a good example of animals that use courtship displays to compete with other males and attract a mate. Like other birds, peacocks engage in ritualized dances, strutting gracefully around the female. In addition, they display their magnificent fan of blue-green tail feathers. Posturing to show the eye spots and beautiful colors to advantage, they also use vocalizations. In this case, mating calls that are generated by vibrations when they shake their feathers. Writing task one. Now listen to a lecture about the same topic. Although it may be true that government censorship has the potential to benefit society, realistically, it's just not possible to enforce. That aside. Let's look at each of the advantages that are mentioned in the reading passage. Hardly anyone would disagree that children should be protected from pornography and other inappropriate websites. The issue is who should protect them: the government or their parents? Software that installs parental controls is readily available and relatively cheap. My position is that responsible adults should monitor their children's internet access. Even if censorship does restrict some viewing, it's still up to the parents or guardians to take care of their children. Now, as for criminal activities, no one wants to deal with this, especially since the internet intrudes into our workspaces and our homes. And censorship helps somewhat, but again, personal responsibility is a better deterrent. Everyone needs to choose and use strong passwords. Install firewalls and antivirus software, avoid opening attachments from unidentified sources, and use good judgment when interacting with unfamiliar people or businesses. But of course, that's true for face-to-face -face encounters and purchases as well. And we don't want the government to censor those. That's for sure. So last, of course, we want to guard our identities and our personal and financial information. And censorship laws may establish standards, but as I said in the beginning, the laws are very difficult, even impossible to enforce. So, in the long run, it comes down to taking care of ourselves. How can we do that? Well, first, we should establish a separate email account for internet transactions, one that we can close down easily if we need to. In other words, we have a disposable identity in cyberspace. Second. 
Never give out personal information like a social security number, credit card, or bank account numbers unless you initiate the interaction. And this is important. Don't divulge too much personal information on social media. If we want to protect ourselves even more, we have the option to subscribe to an identity theft plan. The bottom line is this. To keep our children safe and to avoid being victims of crime or identity theft, we have to take personal responsibility. Censorship on the Internet isn't necessary and it doesn't work. Summarize the main points in the lecture and then explain how they cast doubt on the ideas in the reading passage.